There are eight billion people in this world, you know. What can I sell to them? That's all. And how we align our personal uh, capabilities, the team capabilities, whatever resources we have to align to the market. Okay, so this is our Profit Max podcast, and today we're very, very privileged to spend some time with uh, Dato Professor Paul Chan the founder or co-founder of Health University that everybody knows. Uh, he's an icon in the industry, an icon in Malaysian business, an icon who's an entrepreneur and has done a lot of things and uh, not only here, but internationally as well. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Dato Professor Paul Chan. Good morning, Thank Dato. You. Thank you, Peter. Hi, how are you today? Good, good. But first, let me congratulate uh, your accomplishments oh dear. and setting up this uh, ProfitMax uh, uh, platform it has benefited a lot of people, I noticed. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Thanks for your kind words. Okay, so maybe uh, I, I know people know you and know that, but maybe you could just give a quick, uh, maybe 40 second uh, background of yourself and you know tell us a bit about some of your your accomplishments and things like that, your milestones. Okay, I uh, basically I was uh, in the university for most of my working life. And I was an academic for close to 22 years before I started the HELP, which uh, stands for Higher Education Learning Philosophy. And uh, over this uh, period, I tried to do various businesses, but I failed in all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe in a way it's good. I therefore learned a lot of things that you cannot uh, actually do business in a part-time manner. Yes, and if yes. you don't have the passion and the conviction. So I, I'm from KL and uh, I came from a poor family from the slums of Kuala Lumpur and so on. And I think if there's anything that has helped me to my present uh, situation is uh, education. That's why I return to education because it is something that really can enable other human beings to become what they choose to become. Yeah, mm. not, not making money per se, but choose to be who they want to become. Yeah. yeah. I guess, I guess in a way, it's about raising people to their full potential huh? by helping them realize what they're capable of. And oh, definitely. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. As a CEO mentor yourself, you know that uh, the potential of a human being is almost unlimited, you know. And, and mm -hmm. as long as the person is alive, if he has a high degree of self-awareness, and he has mastered the art of unlearning to unlearn, then he can relearn to become successful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Paul, maybe we can go back to the history and the roots, you know. How did, how did you start HELP? Uh, at that time, I believe it was HELP Institute. How did that idea come about? And how was the transition from being an academic in the University of Malaya to starting your own institute. Tell us a bit about that. Okay, every institution or a businessman has his own uh, journey and mine is not very unique. Uh, when I was in the university, I became somewhat dissatisfied with myself and the environment. I felt that except for research, there's nothing very much I could learn anymore. And it so happens, like all stories about serendipity and so on, around 1984, there was a recession in Singapore, Malaysia, and so on. And we all felt somewhat helpless. So from the word helpless and helplessness, one morning I thought of help, and I forced some meaning into the acronym. Hence, it became higher education learning philosophy. 
During that time, I used to write a column in uh, Nanyang Sang Pao, and some strangers noticed my aspiration. Two or three of them approached me. I didn't have money. I didn't know how to do business. I, I wouldn't know the meaning of a vision, mission, values, all this. I was just a typical academic. So just with uh, 25,000 ringgit of borrowed money, we started a help, a help institute. And uh, I didn't write any vision statement. I didn't write any mission statement and so on. That came very much later, at least 15, 18 years later. But we had the conviction, my wife and I, she also left the job. So we didn't retire. We actually took a high risk to, to leave our very good jobs. I, from the university, in a case from a development bank, and uh, we had no guaranteed salaries, nothing, nothing to fall back on. So we just started because of this conviction that there were so many people who did not have access to tertiary education. So this is mm. a conviction that has become a cause, C-A-U-S-E. -E. So of course, we were very emotionally uh, involved. And in retrospect, I feel that no one can succeed in business if you are not emotionally charged with your beliefs, you know, in this case, the conviction that we should and can do something for marginalized or disadvantaged, or disadvantaged mm, people. Mm, yeah. So that's how we started in a very small shop in Kampong Atap. And we had only about 20 or so uh, students and only mm -hmm. about four or five staff members and most of the time we didn't even have proper salaries <laughs> we had no full-time staff nothing honestly okay. so we grew over the yeah. years through sure hard work and a belief yeah so typical journey of an entrepreneur bootstrapping all the way from the beginning and then building it from there um, yes i i i believe all entrepreneurs have this uh, belief that they can do something but not only have the capability to do something, they believe that it should be done. Yes, yes. Yeah, and you it's see, a you know, value the system in us. Yeah, the conviction yeah. of wanting to reach out and help other people, the marginalized, yes. you're saying. Huh? Yes. So, so when you started, uh, am I right to say that you started off first with, uh, I think it was the University of London program for finance or something like that? Yes, it's very interesting because since I didn't know anything about business, What's a business model? I didn't know. And it so happened. And this is the meaning. If you read some books about business models and so on, opportunity seeking is my wife and I remember there was this thing called the, the distance learning program offered by the University of London. So being an economist, I said, hey, let's start the Bachelor of Science in Economics since it's readily available, but it was delivered through distance learning. You registered, nobody would help you. You study on your own. Mm. So without knowing the term business model, I constructed a business model. So I became a tuition school and nothing more than that. So I added value by getting some friends who have shared values with us and say, Let's teach these people instead of their studying on their own. And that's all. So the value adding is we created a tuition school using somebody's proprietary uh, intellectual property, shall we say, mm. the degree, not okay. owned by us. But during that time, it was available to people. We didn't have to ask for permission and so on. So just like the Chinese phrase, I borrowed a hand to lay an egg. <laughs> and so we, we work yeah. on it, you know, so one thing leads to another and then the three plus zero with uh, an Australian university. But mm. over the years, this particular way of doing business in a very entrepreneurial way has become more difficult because the business 
the industry has become more structured. So the moment the industry is structured, one of the biggest threats to the businessman is regulation. Mm. It's not that we are not smart in strategizing and so on. Whatever is strategized, the moment the government or governments introduce some regulations, your arena to fight the battle is either expanded or reduced. Just like now, when you're restricted, yeah. you cannot move. You have yeah, to absolutely. So yeah. it's like a it's like a curveball from left field, right? Suddenly there's this curveball from you know, yeah. totally unexpected called government regulation, and that changes the whole playing field. Yeah, and this this uh, broadening this uh, talk. That's why entrepreneurs make big money in the wild west. You know, when when this nation <laughs> is starting to open, no regulations, everything is not clear. But the moment the government has become very bureaucratic or efficient, then the opportunities become restricted. So when yeah. we do our SWOT or TOWS, the one of the biggest threats is to understand the regulation for an industry. Mm. Well, certainly it changes your vibe off. Yeah, like yeah. in China, in the case of uh, say Alibaba, Yes. They restrict the boundary of what they can do, so they have to redo the model. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you need a lot of resilience, huh? Oh yes, uh, resilience as in uh, to accept what we cannot change, but to continue to persevere and identify niches in the supply chain, the external supply chain, and how we align our personal our capabilities, the team capabilities, whatever resources we have mm. to align to the market. So to me, strategy is very simple. It's just a sustained alignment of our capabilities to set, to fit, to fit the needs of the customer, nothing fanciful. Okay. So it's a constant alignment between demand and supply. Mm, yes. So there's always a demand for something. There, no, Peter. There are eight yes. billion people in this world. Even yes, the poorest yes. man needs water, salt, sugar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our supply so side is what's the business model? Yeah. So it's matching matching product to or service with market. Huh? Yes. It must be a match. If there's no match, you know, you supply something that's not needed. Exactly. Or something needed yeah. is not supply, you know, then there's a Yeah, the word is FIT. FIT so there are yeah. lots of fanciful models and so on. But after reading so much in the end is, hey, there are 8 billion people in this world, you know. What can yeah. I sell to them? That's all. <laughs> and can I do a good job? And why should they buy from us? Very simple, yes, yeah. very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, simple is not easy, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, in, in fact, I business is very simple. I always say there are only two uh, to, foc to focus on two P's. How to solve the pains of people and how to continue to increase the pleasures of people. <laughs> One is, I don't have a job, so how do I help you? I can't pass my exam, how do I help you? That's the pains. In entertainment, you enjoy the movies. I'll give you more. So only two things. Solve your pains, give you more pleasures. <laughs> that, that's two basic, words only, you know. Basic human needs, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's shift gears back a bit, huh, uh, Prof. Um, tell us a bit about how you scaled up and how do you grow from where you were, you know, starting, as you say, as a shop lot in Kampong Atap. And then to where you are today, where you've got campuses in several locations and so on. How, how was that journey of scaling up? Where, where, did, where was the breakthrough? Actually, it's all about timing in business. It so happens during the time there were only public universities. And as I say, access was difficult. And not many people could afford to go overseas. So one is the restriction of availability accessibility, appropriateness, affordability, four A's. 
I understood the four A's. So I provided something that these people understand, you know, no frills, nothing. Eh? At that time, the people would not say, I need you to give me a big campus. So the, the, the value proposition for the customer is very simple. Give me a chance to get a degree, that's all. But now, of course, it's different. Not mm. only give me a degree, I, I must be delighted by the experience. <laughs> so the, yeah. the model is very simple and we use that and it so happened the market was untapped. So the number of players was very small, only we and two or three other people. There were no other international uh, uh, players or providers. Now it's a free for all, especially now with uh, digitalization and so on and the virtual university. So mm -hmm. the, the, the <clears throat> play field has changed totally. The time, I wouldn't say it was a monopoly market, but it was a very restricted market with some of us who knew the needs of this. And I am not sure about my other colleagues in the business. Many of us, I felt, started it not because we think there was a lot of money to make. I'm quite sure that many of them started because we believe that this is a social business enterprise. You see, so mm -hmm. that, that's how we started. But as you say, over the years, the demand keeps growing and growing for the first 10 years, you know. Wow, from 30 students, it jumped to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and so on, such that we could even list help on the stock exchange. Yes, yes. Yeah. So as we grew from uh, the 1986, the first five, 10 years, we grow to learn the business processes. I have created what is called the M framework, ELM, Entrepreneurship Leadership Management. So in 1986, the E, the entrepreneurship was very strong. So the leadership required to help the E was also very different. It's a very entrepreneurial type of leadership. Mm. But now we are big or bigger, so much bigger, the M becomes very powerful. M stands for all the processes, structure, and so on. So the M facilitates efficiency, but sometimes, in fact, quite often, it uh, stifles entrepreneurship. You see, when I started, I didn't do a survey. I just plunged in, you know, in 86. But now, before we start anything, we have to have numerous meetings of shareholders, board of directors, blah, blah, blah. Yes, so yes. The, the E in the ELM becomes a bit smaller. So I have this insight about the proportion of ELM and we have to constantly monitor this. Yes, Actually, yes. from startup to become a bigger company or a public listed company. It is very different. Yes, yes. I, I fully agree with you, no, Paul? Because yeah. when I work with a lot of the SMEs, I find that, you know, sometimes they are very good, they're very enterprising, very creative, very innovative, full of yes. grit. They can go through fires and all that. Yes. But the management part is a bit weak. Yes. You know? And conversely, like you say, once they bring in the manager, the general manager or whatever to strengthen the management part of the business, then they find that their, their enter, the natural spirit of enterprise kind of diminishes or, or is stifled in a way because of you need to put systems and processes mm. in the place and things like that, no? And so yeah. then, then it, over a period of time, and this is sometimes the growing pains, right? Yes. Where they find an equilibrium and they kind of balance off both of it. But I think, yes. I think the, the point that you're adding is very valuable, which is it's a dynamic balance and it's not rigid. Mm. So at some point, the entrepreneurship needs to drive it and at other points, the management side needs to drive. So it's a it's a kind of a kind of a what do you call a synergistic partnership of the management team and the leadership or the enterprise, the entrepreneur. And yes. that's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy because yeah. uh, ultimately we have to ask some very difficult questions about oneself. Like, what is our personal philosophy 
of life and doing business because each of us enters the business world at different uh, stage in our life. The young people are very fortunate if they enter very young and they can fail many times. When I started help, I was 43 years old. So many people is a bit late, you know, because at 43 and knowing only the academic world, that means we were conditioned by certain habits that we cannot undo. So it's a constant internal conflict, you know. How to, how to give away a lot of bad habits uh, or habits that are not relevant in the business world. Even as simple as how to dress up. You know? I mean, the chemists don't bother about how, to, how we look, you <laughs> see, and so on and so on. Uh, or, or how to dine or whatever. I mean, the life was in the academic world is very different. So our personal philosophy and at what stage in our life cycle is very important. Because mm -hmm. when we start something late, we must therefore know the limits of what we can do. My business is very tough if I use the word business huh? because we are in education. So I have to make sure that I take care of the quality of education. And that's totally different. And then the bottom line is very different as the commercial part. You see, if I were to do manufacturing, I don't have to care about certain parts, you know. If this business is very people intensive. I cannot switch off, switch on, you know. A lecturer can be happy this morning, not happy in the afternoon. But the person who manufactures rubber gloves, the machines are not happy or sad. I mean, they just work <laughs> until it comes out and then you replace. So you see, and at a certain age, you have to think about many things. Should I continue to grow and grow? There are so many opportunities and, and the temptations, you know. Oh, I want to show that I am very successful, grow and grow. And then one day, you make one terrible mistake. And that time, you'll be about 60, 65, 70. <laughs> you see? Yeah, yeah. So this, this oh. is our challenge. This is our challenge. Mm, okay. Uh, so the, the education business, with and with the common, is not meant for every, everybody. Mm. Because you really must believe that you are an, uh, an other-centered person. Everything that you do, you don't think of, hey, what do I get out of it? Then you will not be a very good uh, education entrepreneur. It's a very different thing. Yeah? Mm. Yes. It's about, it's about service. It's about serving others, helping others, guiding others. With yes, no hope, yes, yeah, right. Not, not with any hope of getting anything in return, no, but just purely contributing. Not to... only not getting anything in return, the person that you helped three years ago may be very unhappy with you this morning if you make one mistake. <laughs> you see, if I sell you a cup or a computer, you're not happy. I can give you back 10 computers, 10 cups. I can replace the last three years of your life. That, that is different. Mm. So, so you have you you must have a lot of love for people. You have really have to bear with people. You want to endure them, you know. Mm. You, you see, it's, it's, it's very demanding. That's an interesting insight, huh? No, you the, the problem is this: we may have the insight, but in particular in all service industry using human beings, we can only succeed working with people and through people. I mean, you are a first-class trainer, you know. Everybody wants Peter. But suppose you have another person to assist you, but they may not want that person. Yeah, absolutely. They only want you to coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, so the, the, the problem is the scalability of this type yes, of business. Yes, that's true, that's true. How to uh, disembody the knowledge and the wisdom from the physical human body mm, mm. and the mind you know okay all right um paul maybe tell us you know what were one of the one or two of the biggest challenges that you encountered throughout this period of building help up to where it is today okay i think the one one of one or two of these uh, challenges 
were certain surprises when you have developed a very strong partnership and there's the early stage of our life with some universities and so on. Mm. And if there's a certain change of leadership in our partnership, there's a new vice chancellor in the university. And of course, he has his own mind compared to the former vice chancellor or president. Then suddenly he changes his vision, you know. Mm. Oh, I do not want to do three plus zero with you anymore. <laughs> or because mm. he has his own other business associates, but not V. So these are a certain shock to us. You know? Yeah. See, and, and it happened uh, two, three times in our history. Wow and so on. And of course, uh, when there's a certain change, which is which was totally out of our control, when there was a collapse in the, in the global economy, and at one time our ring it collapsed. So whatever agreements that we signed with the foreign partners to deliver the cause became not possible. So you spend five years, six years to build up a market in the whole of Asia overnight that is gone. Gone. And you cannot immediately bring another name and start, you know. And also, even if you can, especially now, the approval process is very long. Mm. It's not like I introduce uh, Laksa this morning, tomorrow I change your Chao Kui I can't. Whatever you do from the conceptualization state, prototyping all the way will take at least three years to mm. four years. Mm. The approval will take you at least one year, two years. Mm. You see, and, 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 and before the submission, maybe a year, six months to think up some ideas. And then only are you allowed to, uh, to run the program, then mm. you go to the market. The market may or may not accept you because it's, when you conceptualize the idea it was three years ago. And then not only that, you have to prove yourself, then only can you deliver your degree programs mm. overseas. It's not like overnight you are proof you can sell overseas to some partners. And so mm. by the time I can sell, say, to some other countries, probably would have taken me five years. Five years. You see? You know, like a long product development process, huh? Yes, it's like that's why I always alert my friends. Everyone is jumping into Musang King. <laughs> but don't forget, you know, we are all going in at the same time. Yes, yes. So five years later, there will be a glut in the supply. Mm. Or yeah. some smart fellas will say, I changed the brand name, not Musang King. Some other fanciful thing, you know. You see, so those who have planted the durian trees are stuck because yes. the, the business model is not flexible. Yes, yes. You cannot uproot the tree eh, if the yep. price yep. of rubber, palm oil, or durians is low. You, know? yeah. you, have, you are stuck for like, life. Eh? Yeah, it's just like we see the property glut at the moment. Yes. The property overhang. And, and I'm concerned about the glove industry because, you know, everyone seems to be jumping onto the bandwagon. But, you know, that's another story. But, you know, that, Peter, I intervene here. Yeah. I mean, we are both old enough to have witnessed so many business cycles. We now seem to learn the lesson. Many of us jump into an industry when it is too late. You see, at one time, everybody was thinking of uh, planting some fruits just like durance now, or start a golf course to sell the properties. Yes. And many others want to start an international school to enhance the value of the property. Yes. But it may be too late. Not to say the market is not there. Don't forget there are 8 billion people in this world. Mm. And the demand for education and training will be eternal. It can only grow. But our challenge is what is the right 
business model for the 8 billion people. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. On, on that point, uh, Paul, I just want to ask you, you know, the current situation is everybody is on Zoom, everything is on the internet, and even learning is getting to be more and more customized on the internet. How do you see, you know, and, and, and people, I know there's a, there's a radio commercial, I don't know whether you heard it, where the parents are talking to the daughter and then the daughter in the end, okay, okay, I'm going to be a doctor, like, okay, I'm going to study mm. medicine, you know? And then the father says, no way, we want you to be a Dota player, you know? <laughs> the, the, evolving, the evolving changes of new careers, new industries coming up, um, I guess that that could pre present some challenges and the new modes of learning, you know, going online and all that. How, how are you dealing with this kind of trends? Definitely, this is a challenge which to us as education entrepreneur is a great opportunity. Any disruption will kill someone, but will also benefit a lot of people. That's why it's all about how agile we are to adapt and be just a little bit ahead because the learning curve is very short. Mm. Look at education. The education model is very straightforward and simple. Over your lifetime, you have to be assessed such that at the end, you receive a certificate or being certified that you can be an accountant or doctor. But in some cases, getting a degree in business, which is not licensed, okay? So whether you like it or not, in your life's journey, you'll be evaluated somehow. And this is a whole examination process. Mm. And therefore we have this opportunity to help people to do well. It's a very simple business model. Now, along the way, there are different ways of teaching people to be smarter or cleverer or whatever. And of course, uh, the evolution of technology, which is now used in education is definitely something that cannot be stopped. But at the end, it is still the human being behind the technology. So the technology can speed up information can virtualize it and globalize it, can scale it up. But in the end, learning is something very intimate, you know. I mean, you're a great trainer, I know. You see, when you meet with your client or someone you want to mentor, it's a very intimate relationship. It's not just appearing on the screen this morning and blah, 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 using some slides. Yes, many will do this, but the learning also, we must remember, does not end with a degree or entering a university. It's a <coughs> formative learning, as we always say, lifelong learning. Mm. Right now, many of us have to relearn to cope with uh, the difficulties of being immobile you know, at home. How, mm -hmm. So how do we practice yes. virtual Paul, leadership. Paul, Paul, I noticed recently you guys have launched something called the micro... Uh, credentials. Yeah, micro credentials, that's right. I think I think that's quite quite uh, relevant and topical at this time. Is do you, how, how did that come about? Okay, micro credentials, <laughs> thanks to the ministry, are ways of learning <laughs> By, shall we say in a very simple language, by bikes. So we can unbundle a whole degree and offer them differently. But of course, the quality and the standards and the contents must be there. It's just we, we break them apart and we offer to a, a larger audience or group of mm -hmm. learners. And therefore, we have flexibility, and therefore, the cost may be lower and so on. Okay. Basically, a degree can be unbundled, and you can enter at different points using some mm -hmm. of the micro credentials. Mm -hmm. So, you may get credit recognition or exemption from a foreign university or from help university up to 30% of a full degree. Mm. You see? So these are the ways that the learning 
is uh, being uh, innovated because many people may not even want the full degree now. Yes. Uh, they may want to accumulate a cluster of skills. Mm. But the learning is from experiential learning. That yes. means you earn as you learn. <laughs> Mm. So it's not necessary that you must be stuck with a three-year program, yes, four-year yes. program. You know? Yes, yes. Yeah. So are this you, enhances pioneer, the yes, learning yes. process. Yeah. Are you a pioneer in this area of micro-credentials? Uh, we are one of the early uh, innovators in this, okay. and we have a huge number of uh, programs to cater to the 4.0 industrial revolution uh, market. Mm. We have some very strong... Uh, programs in uh, data science, but more importantly in uh, business, uh, applied business analytics at the master's level and also at the undergrad level. What we are planning to do now is to reach out to many adults who have, uh, for some reason, lost their jobs, and we want to work with them and with you, Peter, how do we use micro-credentials in this digital and business analytics to help them upskill and reskill? Mm. Now, you are doing all the soft skills which are needed and excellent, but at the same time, people may want to pick up levels one, two, three, four competency in digital yes. skills. Yes, yes. And, uh, if they are away in Singapore and some other countries like the Greater Bay Area in Hong Kong, the 3J in uh, Beijing, Hebei and Tianjin and so on, the, and Malaysia, of course, the demand for such skills is huge. So all they have to do is if you have lost a job as an engineer or for what, whoever you are, mm. come back upskill through some of these micro-credentials mm. with okay. us but in the relevant areas. Okay. So if people want to find out more about these micro-credentials, Paul, um, when, how do they go about? Do they just um, send an email to help? Or Yes, you can, of course, always write to me or, or write to uh, help. And very soon we are going to have uh, a few webinars on this. But okay. who knows, Peter, I can organize this webinar with you also. <laughs> I mean, to help. Okay. Sure. Uh, All right. Provide opportunities to your to your people. Okay. All right. Uh, just just to wrap it up, uh, Paul. Couple of, two more two last questions. One is, you know, everyone is more or less affected unless you are in the rubber glove industry or you're producing face masks or something. Everyone's in effect, simply affected by this pandemic. No, what would be your advice to business people or the business community during times like this? No, how do we pull through? I think uh, it is a very difficult. Uh, it is very difficult for me to give uh, individualized uh, advices. I can only say something generic, mm. because we are affected very differently uh, at the personal, emotional level. The family, that's one. Of course, the business and so on and so on. I mean, it's very easy to read a lot of articles in the internet. You must do this, do that, and so on. The reality is there's a lot of emotion in the work environment. Mm -hmm. So the most immediate thing to say the obvious is to come back to our own philosophy of life. And the first thing is to accept, you know, some of the things that we really cannot change and then redo all over again, you see. So unless that part is clear, our mind is constantly uh, agitated. We have no peace and calm. You know? When we have no peace and calm, there's a lot of internal conflict. And this will be demonstrated by our behavior in the workplace or in the family. So to exercise this of leadership means that the first thing personally is to have a lot of self-care. We must appreciate ourselves. Otherwise, we lose our self-confidence, self-esteem. 
You see, it's not that we have not achieved a lot in life. It so happens there's this certain crunch, you know. But let's appreciate what we have done all these years. Then we then have a serious look, you know. Hey, perhaps it's a time to really retire and enjoy life. Huh? Because we forget. By the way, I'm 78, I'm still doing. Perhaps I should say, no, I don't want to don't do look it. Yeah. You see? So many people have already accumulated enough. But we forget because when we're in business, nothing is enough. <laughs> you see, so that's the first stage to understand our life. What is it now? We, we already have achieved a lot for most of us. Our children are grown up, some are grandchildren and so on. So there's the first thing. And leadership is not there unless there, are, there is followership. So if you want to restructure, transform our business, we have to look deep inside. What is the strength of our followership? The followership has the following constituents, all the stakeholders. Some are more serious than others. The stakeholders, definitely the shareholders and partners and your colleagues and staff, you know, yeah. then the customers. Okay. So that must be taken care of. Mm. I, I like that very much, uh, Paul. This idea of internal balance, uh, or what you call the emotional state, I think that's extremely important. And, you know, like you say, you know, it's, it's generic advice, but then everyone is different. And at the end of the day, it's about how we manage our emotions, how we deal with the situation that is beyond our control, coming to acceptance so that we stay calm and are able to collect ourselves and think through and prior review our priorities in the situation. Yes, I agree with you, yeah. Yeah. You okay. see, we forget the first question to ask is a very big but difficult question. The human condition, the very big question about humanity, you know. Yeah, like in my house, suddenly all the ants come back, uh, all the ants come back to the house. So should we kill them? Then suddenly you say, hey, nature is back, you know. Nature is back. So we are very, we are part of the Dar Darwinian process. <laughs> However much we think of ourselves as the center of the world, the fact is we are not. We are just one of the whole evolutionary process and we have to accept it. Yeah, okay. You see? All right. And therefore, well, business must be juxtaposed in this context. Otherwise, we forget how to live our life and make ourselves hmm. so miserable because there's a certain uh, setback in business. Okay, all right. So on that note, Dato, I really like to thank you and appreciate you for your time and your wisdom and your nuggets of, of sharing and really appreciate the insights that you've given us in this little chat. And uh, well, look forward to hearing you moving onwards and upwards. Thank you Thanks so much, much uh, Peter, for this opportunity. You're a great person. You have helped many people, I know. And uh, we're appreciative that we have people like you around during this time. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Bye.